Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Thanks to John for coming today. Um, my name is Julie Boris. I'm one of the founders of Health Rights MA, Health Rights Massachusetts. And uh, we're a small nonprofit grassroots, I would say not even small anymore, we're getting bigger and bigger by the day, uh, nonprofit organization. And our mission is to ensure that the fundamental right to bodily autonomy, including the right to exercise informed consent and the right to privacy of personal medical information, is legally protected in the state of Massachusetts in regards to all your medical and health care decisions. So one of the things that we did this last session was we filed a couple of bills and we worked with legislators to file some bills that would protect bodily autonomy. There was one bill that would prohibit COVID-19 vaccine as a condition of entry, which doesn't prohibit anybody that wants a vaccine from getting one. It just prohibits anybody from being mandated to go to school or work or, you know, anywhere else for that matter. Um, and we had another bill that was um, a the an act relative to bodily autonomy and family integrity, which was a broader fundamental rights bill that just basically put into the law in Massachusetts that in spite of the fact that there might be a health emergency, all people have the fundamental right to make their own decisions and you can't force them to do something against their will in order to go to school or work. So we were just trying to put in a little uh, limits on the governor's powers for what he can do to us <laughs> during a health emergency. Um, so that our rights are protected and our bodily autonomy is protected. So, um, and in all of their infinite wisdom, the legislature chose to send both of these bills to study again. So um, just keep that in mind when you're voting. Um, there are many bills that are not yet sent to study that are of concern, and I'm not going to talk about any of them today, but I am going to tell you I have pieces of paper up front and out there where you can take, and it's all about the bills that are still active in the legislature that really need to be opposed, and they need to be opposed by you, like all of you, okay? Um, and there's things that you can do and letters that you can send and you know everything we can to make it really easy um, and just show a very broad opposition to these bills or ask them to be amended to um, fix the problems because they further infringe on our rights and our parental rights, not only our own right to bodily autonomy, but our right to make decisions for our children to go to school. So those are all really important, and they're, they're trying to pass them. They're not dead, which means they want them to pass. So we really need to get active now. So again, you can grab those up here or out there. Um, one of the things that uh, Health Rights Mass did was and just so you know, I'm not going to talk for very long. I just had like a few slides and then I'll introduce John. But um, we, we started collecting stories of injury and loss and people that were being coerced when the COVID vaccine started. So way back in 2021, we just put up a form on our website. We sent it out via email. We don't, I mean, that's how we communicate with people. Um, and all this information is heavily censored. And that's why we're here today, because we just really want to be able to hear what John found out when he really did an analysis of what happened in our state in regards to COVID. Um, but we have over 200 stories that were reported of either injury, someone that took the vaccine and got injured, someone that lost someone, you know, to a, to, right after a COVID vaccine, um, and also people that lost their jobs or couldn't go to school. Like there were tons of stories like that um, because they said no. Um, and some people that were coerced and got injured, so they, but they got it kind of from both sides. So we're still collecting these stories. If you or someone you know has a story and you want to share it, we're still collecting them. We published a book of 86 of those stories, delivered them to every legislator in the state house, um, personally, and delivered them um, so that they could see what was happening to the people of Massachusetts. Um, and we do have a couple copies up here. Um, if you're interested in looking at them. We invited a lot of those people, including John, to the State House to share those stories. You can hear all of the, there was 25 people, um, two legislators, and um, they all shared their stories, different things. One doctor who lost her job and other people, nurses, firefighters, um, police, state police. We had three state police that spoke, and then a lot of people that got vaccine injured, um, and they shared their stories. I'm going to take that slide. Um, 
COVID-19, um, and he, so after all that, they didn't really listen still. So in January 2022, we, we worked with a group called We the People 50, which John is part of. And we said, bring us all these, all your experts to Massachusetts um, and let them talk to our legislators. Like, we'll help set it up. You bring the people. And so that's what happened. So we worked with all of these amazing people. They all showed up on a call to the legislature, to the public health officials. If you're on our email list, you got asked to invite people. Um, 850 people ended up on that call, on that webinar. And that was just the live one, and it's been replayed thousands and thousands of times. Um, hundreds of thousands of times probably by now. Uh, health Rights Mass is now sponsoring Health Freedom Radio. And it's on WCRN. You can listen to it or you can listen to the replay. So if you can't catch it live on AM, no big deal. You can catch it anytime. All the shows are up there for replay. Um, but this is a way for us to reach out of our censorship bubble um, and start having conversations and start educating people outside. So now, oh, one last thing, sorry. Um, I know that the information you're going to see could be alarming. And I want people to know there's an organization, I'm so sorry I didn't put the slide in here, but it's react19.org. And they're a really good resource if you know someone who's injured, if you think you're injured, um, they're a really good resource to get more information and take next steps to maybe get some help. Um, or, you know, they even help fund people that are vaccine injured to get the help that they need um, and point you in the right direction. So, John Bowden. Uh, John is a Massachusetts resident, electrical engineer, and author of two new books, The Real CDC and The CDC Memorandum. And um, John also got his M MBA, and he went back to law school uh, in his 50s, as of what, fourth career, fifth career? Um, he's done a deep dive researching causes of death, cross-referencing his data with the VAERS system, which is the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. Um, and he's been presenting his data all over the country. He was featured on um, Epic T TV recently. He was on The High Wire, where he talked about his findings in Massachusetts. The High Wire has up to 6 million views per week around the world. So that's highwire, thehighwire.com, and you can watch that on Thursdays at 2. But um, now I'm going to give the floor to John. We're going to get rid of my presentation. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm fine. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. All right, very good. I feel like kind of Forrest Gump right now because on my way here, <clears throat> I passed a few things that are way back in my life, like um, uh, the Price Chopper. <laughs> yeah, I went to school in uh, Rensselaer, Toronto, New York. We had the Price Chopper yeah. in yeah. the 80s. And that's when generics came out. I just remember walking down the I'm only looking for one thing in a grocery store, okay? Beer. <laughs> they had white cans with um, black label on it, and it was an aerial font. You know, plain, plain, plain. And it just said beer on the side of the can. <laughs> so that's, that's one memory. Another one, uh, I used to go to SHR3. Any deck people here? Digital Equipment Corporation? No? Oh, there's one. You know, you know what SHR3 is then, probably. Okay. Um, I traveled around all, mostly New England. And uh, deck was huge, and I used to go to Littleton, Acton, and uh, Maynard, and, and here, Shrewsbury, SHR3. They did a lot of processor design, the Alpha processor, but then Intel kind of, it, it's a long story. Forget it. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> if anybody has any questions, um, we, we, we can entertain them in the middle. It's okay. So if you want to raise your hand, uh, it, some of this is going to be a little bit technical. I, I tried to only bring bar graphs. The, other, the waveforms are, are kind of tough to look at and, and explain uh, to a broad audience. But um, let's just get right into it. And again, stop me if you really want to know something that's important. All right. <clears throat> We're in Massachusetts, and people here don't realize how important Massachusetts was to COVID, or is to COVID, or the COVID narrative, the COVID era, um, and so forth. Moderna's headquarters, manufacturing, R&D in Massachusetts. Pfizer's divisional headquarters for the mRNA is in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has over 600 pharma ecosystem companies, over 47 billion in venture capital financing, 10 companies over a billion in revenue each year in pharma in Massachusetts, 
50 companies over 100 million a year in Massachusetts. Uh, Walensky, the old, um, uh, the former CDC director, Massachusetts. My congressman is Jake Auchincloss. His father is Hugh Auchincloss, who worked for Fauci for 20 years as number two guy. Massachusetts is tightly tied to all of this. And, well, do I have to read all these? Santa I'll go fast. Sanofi, Thermo, Fish, Novartis, Takeda, Biogen, Merck, Bristol-Myers, Squibb, J&J, &J, AstraZeneca, Amgen, PSK, uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Just a few in Massachusetts. So what did Massachusetts do, along with the executives from, say, BlackRock and the holders of all the pharma stocks, the big ones, down at Wall Street in New York City, of which New Jersey is a suburb. So if you were to look at, say, all the sovereigns in the world with 3 million people or more and looking at U.S. states as, as sovereigns individually, so all the U.S. states with 3 million people or more and every nation in the world with 3 million people or more, rank them in purported COVID deaths. What were they saying? How many deaths were they saying were from COVID? After that first wave on July 27th, New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts led the world. A virus started in China halfway around the world and the place, the three places that had the most to gain had the most reported deaths by far. Belgium was a distant fourth. Massachusetts was 50% more than Belgium at that time. I'm not gonna blow up the rest of the graph, but you can see Sweden that did no lockdowns, no masks, didn't close businesses, they kept bars open. They kept restaurants, everything was open. That's the yellow. Every month I did this. These are a few months apart because it gets wide if I do every month. But this is a year that you're seeing in time going across. All the, comp all the countries, nations, states that put in all these measures kept passing Sweden. Sweden's in yellow, you see over time. They ended up in 44th place uh, on this, well, that was a couple months later. This is 38th, I think. Meanwhile, Massachusetts is in teal blue. After a year, still in third, reporting all these COVID deaths. So um, is that a coincidence? Because you're from Massachusetts, I led with this. I sometimes don't present this, but it's important to know why the fraud happened. Um, I, I call it fraud. All right, so this, this is the thesis. If you were to open up my book and go to the, I think it's the introduction, or it could be the preface, um, either one, somewhere it says thesis, and this is it. <clears throat> the symptom spectrum profile. So it's the causes of death in our society. The profile of, of how people died, what they died from, what's on death certificates. So that and the age spectrum profile, the average age of death, and by average age of death by cause or in total. And the seasonality profile, the time of year that people died. If you were to look at all cause deaths, you'll see a um, sine wave, sinusoidal, I should say. It's not a sine wave. A mathematician corrected me. It's not a perfect sine wave. Uh, but it is sinusoidal. More people die in the winter than die in the summer, especially in northern climates. And it's really over 80. That, that, that sine wave, most of the people who die are over 80, and they die more in the winter than the summer. So if you look at all-cause deaths, it seems like it's the same for everybody, but that's not true. More, more kids die in the summer. You can probably figure out why. Um, driving fast, going to parties, not, you know, that, that they die from accidents in the summertime. So those three profiles of excess deaths, so if you strip away what's normal and look at what's left over, normal being 2015 through 2019, take that pattern, subtract from 2020 and 2021 what that pattern was, what's left over in the excess deaths changed starkly on a year boundary from 2020. So we had, I'll just tell you right now, mostly respiratory excess in 2020. Okay, there was a uh, disease that came through, call it a cold, call it a flu, or if you like COVID, call it a COVID. It did kill people by mostly respiratory means. All of a sudden, on 2021, everything switches. Instead of respiratory, the excess deaths become clotting and bleeding. Like, does a disease just change how it kills you? Yes? Can you define an excess death? Oh, so, yeah, that's a really good one. Everybody around the world, they just talk about excess death. What is it? Like, what do you use for a basis? It's what is more than expected. So then what's expected? How do you define expected? People who take five-year averages and then compare to the five-year average, uh, that's, that's terrible to me. Because let's say you have one, two, three, four, five. What would you expect the next year in the sixth year? 
the average of that is three. Do you expect three? Your five-year average of one, two, three, four, five is three, right? Say, so, oh, it's six. That's 100% more than average, more than expected. No, every, every person here would expect six, right? So what I do is I use a linear least squares approximation. Big words, it means you get five points on a graph. And it's like, what's the approximate line that goes among those points? With only five points, I don't use polynomial curve fitting or advanced methods like that. There's no purpose to it. So I approximate a line with a slope and y-intercept. And it's just, uh, you can use the function slope and intercept in, in Excel. That's simple. And then you draw a line, your next year is expected along that line. And you'll see it in the graphs. I don't use inferential statistical methods. How, how do scientists communicate what they find with people? They do it through all these statistical methods and papers that they write. And uh, I, I don't want to, if there are any PhDs here in that, we can talk later. I won't bore the crowd with it. Um, I don't think they're appropriate for epidemiology. I've spoken to I don't know how many, but I've mentioned this to many of them. They nod and agree with me, but then they fall back to what they've done their entire careers. The, the whole field of epidemiology is based upon these inferential statistical methods. Um, so we'll get into that later. Does that answer the question? Yeah, but, but I, I guess you're saying though, excess deaths are numbers above the expected. Yes, yeah. excess is above expected. Expected is based on linear least squares okay. approximation, unless the slope is negative, and then I, I use the average because it would create more, and I'm trying to be more fair and more conservative. Got it. One more question regarding age of death. Did I hear correctly that the median age of death from COVID is actually higher than current life expectancy? Oh, yeah. Well, in the first year it was, 2020. In the second year in Massachusetts, it was right on the edge of the 75.3 to 75.8. So the average age of COVID death was 75.8, but the prior years were 75.3 to 75.8. So it was within that range, the second year. The first year was like six years above, 81.3. Yeah. And that's, that's really important, actually. I'm not going to get into the age differences here. There's not enough time. I'm just going to do the, the, uh, the top one here. Um, but the important thing to note is that diseases don't change how they kill, whom they kill, and when they kill during the year on a year boundary. Something else came into our society in 2021 in January. I wonder what that could be. <laughs> right? Something else comes in and people are dying of different things at different times of year in different ages being much younger. <clears throat> There's the Massachusetts pandemic. If you want to call it a pandemic, it's nine weeks from mid-March to mid-June. You see how stark that is. Now, the dashed lines are 2020. The dots that you probably can't see from where you are are 2021. I did my book in black and white, no color, so I had to use dashes and dots to differentiate. But if you see at the end of the year and at the very beginning, you do see some dashes. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at those in a second. And here they are. So this is 2020 and 2021 in a time linear fashion instead of all, all 2015 through 2021 on top of each other like you just saw. So you see a nine week pandemic. The pandemic turns off in the virulent strain, if you will. I, I don't like the variants and the strains. And it's, it's really a mishmash of all kinds of variants in, in which some are more dominant over time. But people like to talk about the Alpha and the Wuhan and the Delta and the Omicron, <coughs> that it's not just one strain that's going around. Um, but anyway, it returns to zero in the summer. You see the big one, and then it starts hovering around the zero line. But then you, have, you do have a smaller wave, like a seasonal flu, a uh, cold. You know, more people are going to die in winter. So you, you do have that second wave up there. This is all caused deaths, by the way. And that's more than normal. So yes, we did have more, more than normal deaths. There were excess deaths, and quite a few. But what really bothers me is that when you get into 2021, it goes above normal in the summertime. It's no longer seasonal. You have excess deaths occurring, and that's after all these excess in this huge wave. They can't die again. They're dead. Mm -hmm. These are people in their 90s that got wiped out. So if it went back to normal and... That, that's normal because in the summertime, doesn't matter what age you are, not a lot of people are dying. Uh, I already said the, young, the younger people are, but there's so few of them. doesn't matter. 
And when you get to that winter one, you would expect that, but, but it should be negative, and it does dip a little bit negative. You can see that in the first part of 2021 over there on the right, before that uh, square, that rectangular box I drew. It does go a little bit negative. But then in the summertime, when there should be more deficit all year long, it jumps up. Mm -hmm. What is killing people in excess in the summertime? That's, that kind of set me off to uh, really dig in. Um, I'm going to kind of follow the book a little bit, and the, there's a little bit of CDC memorandum as well. The CDC memorandum has Minnesota and Massachusetts, and the book only has Massachusetts, and uh, there's, there's more coming. Um, can't talk about it, but I'll say there's hopefully by the end of May, there's going to be a big uh, reveal. I'm not trying to tease you. I'm just telling you what, what's on my schedule. I just hope to be able to get it done by the end of May, and it's going to be big. All right, so this is all cause, COVID, and pneumonia. And what I drew in the red, um, you see the red lines are kind of what's normal, right? It's, it's 2015 through 2019. And then it goes into the box, and I want to show you in the box what happens from 2020, the year of major COVID, and you saw that big spike in the first one, to 2021. So the marginal difference, let's say what's about, I'll call it the marginal difference, what's above the normal line, right? of 2020 gets cut in half in 2021, in all costs. And COVID from 2020 to 2021 gets cut in half, right? And then uh, pneumonia. Again, that marginal difference is cut in half. They're all the same pattern. So if somebody gets COVID, okay, they die from COVID, <laughs> but they also have pneumonia, you would expect that to follow. And because it's so many, you would expect all cause to follow the pattern, and they do. So throughout the rest of this that I, the presentation that I show you, keep in mind that these were cut in half. The marginal difference was cut in half from 2020 to 2021, right? Okay. And then I looked at COVID by age group. And um, just if you look to the right, you don't have to squint to see. The younger people went up. They survived the whole year of COVID. It went through our society. You, you, nobody can tell me that the young people didn't encounter COVID with all of those people dying in 2020. They were fine. But they were fine until 2021. They died more than they did in 2020. So the strong immune system, younger people, under 60, went up, not down. But it was masked because there's a lot fewer of them than there are old people who die. And so the older people show what you would expect. It went down. It was cut, marginal difference was cut in half here and there, and even more in the 85 pluses <clears throat> and the 65 to 74s. This doesn't make any sense if it's a virus. Oh, the virus skips over the young people and gets them the next year. It is just, none of this makes any sense if you were to consider this a virus. Oh, the virus is killing people. I want to tackle acute renal failure first. Um, I don't know how to impress this upon people more than to compare it with the Spanish flu of 1918. So my, um, my grandmother died in 1918. My father was 46. He'd be 106 this year. Um, I'm only 59. He was 46 when I was born. So, and he was six months old when his mother died, just to show you the math. So yeah, my grandmother really did die in 1918 from the Spanish flu. This is the worst thing of a single cause of death that's happened in the United States since 1918. It's worse than the Hong Kong flu or anything. So I need the smallpox. Put them all up to this. A single cause of death that is so bad, 3,000 people, excess, more than normal, in the last three years died with acute renal failure on their death certificate. Who have you heard this from? Why isn't our health department looking at this? Why isn't the CDC looking at it, the NIH, the FDA? Because they're causing this. They made this happen. Some people say remdesivir. I don't know. I, I, I found, um, I have, one's a 4,000 page medical report, another's a 6,000, another's a 12,000. I look through them, I find certain words. Remdesivir was only on two. These are not vaccinated people of the, I have six of them. Not vaccinated. Two remdesivir, two baricitinib, all five had vancomycin. 
So all five were septic, they were given vancomycin, and the kidneys failed. And I, I don't want to say the name, but a very well-known nephrologist told me, no, it, it can't be vancomycin, John. Okay, I've heard that from doctors a lot. You're wrong, John, you're wrong, you're wrong. Two years later, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you were right. Um, over and over, it's a running joke with a couple of guys. Uh, and it's not me, it's just the data, like telling them what is. They're telling me it's wrong. Like, no, the data shows. It. So this is huge. It's huge. 3,000 extra people. And they're not old. The 25 to 44 group, about 60 extra people in Massachusetts. And that's not including 23, 2023. So they'll tell you, oh, this 38-year-old this, uh, died from COVID. Really? You mean he went into the hospital with COVID? And then he had a positive test, so he started running remdesivir through his veins, so you get the extra money from CMS.gov with the NCTAP, which is 20% added to the entire hospital bill. So it's a, if it's a million-dollar ICU stay, it's $200,000 extra to the hospital to run remdesivir through their veins. That's not enough, though. They want money from the ventilator. They want money to put COVID. They already got the money to put COVID on their, on their chart. They get the money to put remdesivir through their veins. They got more money to get, get them on the ventilator, too. If you subsidize something, you will get more of it. I like to say Walter E. Williams, but I'm sure other people said it. I think Thomas Sowell said it, and Milton Friedman also said it. Every economist knows if you subsidize something, you'll get more of it. They subsidize people being put on ventilators. They get more people put on ventilators. My career was mostly in sales. Large contracts, really technical. I had to interface among uh, you know, CTOs, CFOs, CEOs, eight-figure contracts, no, no cost of goods sold. It's kind of like... $200 million deals. <clears throat> and in doing so, you have to explain things across different people. And it's all behavior and, and motivation. How do you get somebody to behave the way you want them to, to sign a contract or to tell his people to use something when they're not using it? Um, these behavior modifications is what the CARES Act is. It modifies the behaviors of the doctors and the hospitals to do what they want them to do. And the doctors in the hospitals think they're doing the right thing. It's like, oh, this guy's dying of COVID. i got to use what the CDC tells me. I'm deviating from the presentation, but it's important. Um, e e I'll just do it real quick. EBM, evidence-based medicine. It came about from a law that was passed in Canada in the mid-1960s. They revamped their healthcare system. And part of that was um, redoing the medical schools and universities in Canada. <clears throat> they took the scientific method and they're going to enhance it because it's just not good enough. We got to add more to it. And they created evidence-based medicine in which they somehow it, it became that the literature is more important than the patient in front of you. And what I, I just use my head. I'm very practical. I'm an engineer. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a mathematician. But I think in, in overall systems, not just medical, but what are the, the behavioral patterns of a person? How will he change his behavior given a cancer diagnosis? Is he going to stop drinking milk or smoking? Or, you know, all those changes are other input variables, right? So what happened with evidence-based medicine is that these two guys, is, um, McMaster University came up with something, they, and they got called EBM, evidence-based medicine. And somehow it made it, that, that was coined in like 81. But it got into every medical school in North America by 1992. So every doctor that's gone to med school since 1992 has been indoctrinated into evidence-based medicine where the literature is the most important thing. It's drilled into their heads. So the older doctors who didn't do that, it's like, uh, tell, me, tell me, Bill, what's been going on? Oh, you know, I, I eat the same thing, and I just, you know, I've been drinking a lot lately, and I just feel like I have something wrong with me. And the doctor used to be engaged, looking him in the eyes. You can, you can see whether Bill is telling the truth about each individual symptom and what's going on in his life. Maybe he's not saying, well, you know, my kids are driving me nuts. Um, it could be some, some stress that's causing something. But, and the doctor can figure that out because he's engaged. Who's been to the doctor now? It's like, you know, they're, they're typing into the laptop. The laptop's telling them how to treat you. They're not even making the decision. Because if they don't treat you the way the laptop says to treat you, and the laptop, by the way, is the literature, it could be a study from halfway around the world with a different water supply, different food, right, different genetics, and he's treating you based on some guy in India 
or a, a, a town or whatever, whoever wrote the paper. <clears throat> Meanwhile, you're sitting there, and, and if he was a thinking person, he would say, if he was young, he would say, hold on a minute, let me get my, let me get my other guy. And he brings in the guy with 40 years experience in the 60s or 70s. The guy's like, oh, yeah, I saw that 50 years ago. Yeah. You know, we, we've lost that. And when we lose that, we lose people at the margins of normalcy. What's normal, right, is easy. The computer, we don't need the doctor anymore. We can use the AI on the computer from all the literature to treat a patient. But if you're on the edges of normalcy, or, or if you're right outside what is normal, instead of using his own brain as a doctor, he's deferring to the laptop. And um, that's, that's what's happened. So when people say, how can this be a conspiracy such that they're all involved? You can't tell me that every doctor is killing people on purpose. Like, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that from a central point of authority, they make a policy change. And it funnels down to, say, 70% of the doctors or 60% will just comply. The other 30% will go, you know, I know this is wrong, but, you know, they're going to pull my license if I complain about it. I better not speak up. All right, that, now they get 90% of the doctors. They get 10% who either quit or try to fight it, and they do what they did to Merrill Nass, you know, suspend her license to practice. They went after John Littell in Florida. Um, Byron Bridal in Canada, I don't know if you heard of him. He's not a doctor. He's a, uh, oh, this is a funny one. Before I go on, they'll tell one more story before I go. <laughs> so I was on these calls. Um, once a week, two hours on a Thursday before a uh, podcast that Steve Kirsch used to do. And it was a bunch of big names. One of them was Byron Bryan. <clears throat> so Byron was told since he didn't get the vaccine, he can't come to campus. He is a immunologist and virologist professor at the University of Guelph in Toronto. Yelling at him, getting mad at him, ostracizing him were the history professors and the literature professors. Get the vaccine. You know, the three professors at the University of Guelph who did not get the vaccine, the three of them that got yelled at by every other professor, are the immunology professors. <laughs> Come on. You know, it's, it's just comical. Like, you got to listen to the government, <clears throat> not the experts. Wait a minute, who's the experts? I don't think. I better get back to this or I'll just talk all day. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, again, this is huge. This is every age group. And it's, it's not just, you know, the, the young going up and the old going down like the other one. Every age group is going up and it's a massive amount of death. And if you multiply the life years lost, okay, somebody who's 40, the average age of death, say, is 75. Mm -hmm. I can do math. 35 years. So it's 35 years per person at the age of 40. If somebody dies at 81, they're already over the average age of death. And I'm sorry, but it's different. We expect people who are older to die. It doesn't create pathologies in children. Children growing up without fathers, mothers, you know, they, they have depression, drugs, everything bad that you can think of. Many of them do fine. I mean, I, uh, I, I'm all right. <laughs> I went through everything as a kid. <laughs> um, and I was okay. Uh, not all right, but uh, I was okay. I made it out. I went to school. I did well. Um, went to an elite uh, engineering school. President of my class, uh, Spanish Honor Society, National Honor Society, cross country team, swim team, track team, all kinds of <laughs> awards in science and math. And um, I can tell you that the kids of divorced parents back in the 70s, most of them didn't do well. I know somebody whose parents died, they didn't do well. So these pathologies in the younger people, it's a far reaching. Um, effect on society than an 81 year old who dies or a 90 year old who dies, right? There's a 98 year old woman in Vermont. <clears throat> Forget her name. I think it's, I think it was Doris, and it, or Martha. This isn't one of those older names, you know? <laughs> she was 98. Let's say 98. She died of a heart attack. Okay, but then I find the VAERS report. She was injected. Her heart rate went to 145 beats per minute right away, and she was dead in two days. They ran her out of beats with tachycardia, which is known from the vaccine. So who, who, would, who would challenge that? But that's evidence. The vaccine immediately affected her, ran her heart up, and killed her. That's one of many. I use that as an extreme in the old. The younger ones, you know, I, 
I flew in on a red eye from Vegas. I, I don't want to get emotional right now. Um, I, I, fewer of the slides this time are of people, but I mostly concentrate that people is the most important thing. I'm going to go into speed mode now. All right, uh, acute renal failure. This is what it looks like if you look at a, a nine year timeline. So you see what's normal, and then you see that big spike, that first big spike there. That's that um, spring. It, the spike is not centered on the bar between the years like the others are. That's because COVID came in March. So you have that spring one. A lot of older people were cleared out. They died with renal failure, not from it, during that first nine week period. But it appears as though it's pretty high. As high as that is, look at 2021, 2022, that last big peak. It blows away that first peak you saw. And you saw that all cause was going down. Now remember, all cause is going down, pneumonia is going down, COVID is going down. Look what this is doing. They're killing more and more people with acute renal failure. And they're not even studying it. And, and this, this is a big thing for me. I, I don't know how to stress this enough to people. Now, what happened in uh, 21 is um, I wrote a paper, did a video. It's all about the blood. So they say, well, the vaccine can't be causing all these things. That's crazy. Like, no, it's causing one thing, but your blood system goes everywhere. If it goes in your blood and it goes to your brain, you know, you, got, you have a stroke. It goes to your lung, you have pulmonary embolism. It goes to your heart. Everybody talks about myocarditis, but there's a lot more stuff. That's only 10% of the overall VAX deaths is myocarditis, probably less. <coughs> Okay, here we go fast. The immune mechanism, these D8 codes, they pertain to the, the blood uh, creating um, lymphocytes, leukocytes, neutrophils, and all that kind of stuff. All your white cells, right? <clears throat> the immune mechanism. So your immune system is dysregulated after getting these vaccines. Coincidence or not, it's happening. Immediately, we know that your leukocytes and neutrophils drop. That was an immediate paper in 2021. We knew that. Oh, it's only for a few days. But if you use rate functions, um, your body's trying to fight something at the same time that thing is growing. Which one is growing faster? They're not linear curves. So you have, I'm trying to do it with my hands. Um, you have functions where one will grow faster and you'll start feeling like, like crap and then the antibodies will take over and then you won, right? But if you give a head start to a disease or a pathogen, then you've pushed out in time that intersection where your immune system beats the disease, if it does before it kills you. And so pneumonia, which I didn't put in here, I'll just say pneumonia deaths in the younger, the third wave is far bigger than the first wave. The 21-22 wave is far bigger than the 2021 20, wave and bigger than the original 20 wave. The third wave in younger people of pneumonia is far bigger. It makes no sense at all, other than your immune system's wrecked. Do you have a question? Are they vaxxed? Are you insinuating that they're I'm insinuating they're vaxxed, yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't see how that can happen otherwise. All right, acute post hemorrhagic anemia, um, sudden blood loss anemia. You have, you have a bunch of blood go somewhere. Now, um, this is, I looked through individual records because these are 104 and 22, 89 and 21. I looked through every one, uh, which ones were traumatic, which ones were not. If it's an oopsie with a scalpel in the surgery, then, you know, a guy bleeds out, guy couldn't stop the bleeding. All right, that, that would be in here, but 89% um, were not traumatic. And the ones that were traumatic, uh, car accidents or whatever, um, that 11%, they're questionable. So it could have been something else. Aortic dissections are occurring after vaccination. Gastrointestinal hemorrhages are occurring after vaccination. Intracranial hemorrhages, hemorrhages are occurring. So this is a huge one. You see the difference. That's 2020 isn't even, isn't even normal. It's below normal. 21, boom, it doubles. And 22, it's even worse. 23, uh, I don't have here, but it's pretty bad. Uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. I guess I'll take this time to explain. On the left are raw data numbers, and on the right are percentages. The percentages are of all cause death. So we have an extra 8,800 people die in 2020. That huge first wave, 
They also died of other things. There are other things on their death certificates. So having an extra 9,000 people die, I don't know, 13 or 14 percent increase in one year in, in, cause, in all causes, it carried with it everything. There were more pneumonia, there were more everything. So if you want to see how is a cause of death trending within all the people who died, that's what's on the right. What percentage of all of them? Otherwise, 2020 would look like, oh, it can't be the vaccine because it happened in 2020 also. Like, no, it's occurring at a much greater rate as a percentage of all-cause deaths. So the graphs on the right are kind of more indicative of what's happening. And if you look at on the left, you'll see that 2020 was higher at 94, and then it's 96 and 100, right? It, now remember, the marginal difference should have been cut in half along with all-cause COVID pneumonia, but it's not in all these graphs I'm showing you. It's going up, not down like it should, right? But when I adjust for all-cause deaths on the right, you see that 2020 was just the same as 2018 and very close to 2016, 2019, but 21 and 22 are significantly higher. It's very noticeable, and that's clots all through the body. Other coagulation defects, um, the same thing is done. You see that uh, 2020 is still higher than all the rest, but the marginal difference changes from being um, higher than, 20, say, 2019 to 2020. If you can see right there, um, you see the jump is there, but on the next graph, the jump is a year later because I've adjusted for the all-cause deaths. All right, that's clots involved somewhere. Thrombocytopenia, low platelet count. This graph speaks for itself. Uh, I don't think anybody has any questions on this. Um, as, as high as 21 was, it doesn't look that high, does it, when you look at 22? So if I took 22 out of there, 21 would be that tall one and the others would, would be less. Now let me, those were blood, let me get into circulatory system or, or the blood transport system. It's all about the blood, right? <clears throat> Lymph vessels and nodes. Here's where I explain the, the percentage and I draw a line. See, 2020 is where that blue star is on the left. It's above the line. It's above the 2017 number where I just drew that red line across. But if you adjust for all cause deaths, now you see that it really is only 21 <laughs> and 22. It's not 2020. That's, that's in terrible excess. Those are just people who died um, <clears throat> with, um, with lymphatic vessels or lymph nodes issues in their 90s or whatever um, in that nine week span. Deaths involving clots and veins. Uh, again, 22 is higher, 21 is not that high going to go faster. Pulmonary embolism, again, the, the percent of all-cause deaths shows the stark difference between 2020 and 2021. And by the way, this is, whoops, 500 excess deaths. Whoops, there we go. About 500 excess deaths in two years in Massachusetts. These are, a lot of these are kids. I don't mean like, um, I mean like 16 to 30, you know, that, that's a kid to me. I'm 59. They shouldn't be dying from pulmonary embolism. It's very rare that younger people get clots in their lungs. And, and these generally start in the leg, and then they travel up to the lungs. They're not treated. Okay, cardiac arrest. Um, this, this, this really shows that 2020 looks like it's bad, and then when you adjust for total deaths, it's, it's right in line with the other years. It's like, you know, trip, fun with numbers or tricking people or something. Oh, it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, this, this one kind of tells the story. Um, I mean, if you look, we're talking 11,000 deaths, 12,000 deaths. Th this is 15% um, of all deaths in Massachusetts carry these codes. And people say, oh, cardiac arrest. That has to do with the heart. Cardiac. Well, no, <laughs> cardiac arrest means the heart stopped. Every death ends in cardiac arrest. If you jump off a building, it's cardiac arrest eventually, right? But it's kind of silly to put that on a death certificate. But a lot of the, a lot of the medical examiners, if, if you get COVID, then pneumonia, and then you end up dying because your heart stops uh, and you can't breathe, cardiopulmonary arrest. It's on a lot of death certificates. So when you hear about heart disease is up, they're including this. And it has nothing to do with the heart. And so that's, that's one thing, a problem I have with the WHO and the way they code it. 
it's kind of a bug in the system that I found. Um, and I've talked to some people. Where, you're going to see more about that maybe. Uh, all, all of the heart studies of, oh, cardiac deaths are up. They're all going to have to change because they all did it wrong because they included this. should not be included. But you see the difference. I just wanted you to see when you adjust for all-cause deaths, 2020 is gone. Yes? So is the government saying there was different variants and that's why they it maybe went up? Um, I don't know if the government's saying anything about this because they didn't do any of this analysis. Okay. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the only one. I mean, that really I, I don't believe that personally, but it's it just seems that they maybe they they make all kinds of excuses. The the, the prothrombotic effects of COVID. Um, if you want to know my opinion, I don't know what my opinion's worth. I'm not a biologist or a doctor. Yeah, COVID's real in my opinion. A lot of people are going to get mad at me. Well, viruses don't exist. There's no you've never proven it. I don't care. <laughs> they exist and uh yeah COVID's real i think the government made it i do i think it was a bioweapon that they were trying to create a you know they want to study it so they create it was it an escape no i think they dropped it off in certain places on purpose sorry um took me a while to get there i never would believe that I was never like conspiracy theorist just leave me alone about the ufos all right five <laughs> Uh, I get the 5G people hate me, the UFO people hate me, like, just leave me alone. Just, viruses are real. This had a prothrombotic effect, which was different from any cold. It was not, not just the cold, but you have strong mucosal defenses, and in the rare chance, and I mean rare, not like the government uses it, but I mean like the original meaning, rare, um, it, it does get past your mucosa, especially if you shove a trach, if you ventilate somebody, and you scratch a little bit, create an opening that stuff can get into, it gets into. And, and so many people die from bacterial infections, uh, but if, if the virus gets into your system, then it goes to your brain. Yeah, COVID really does cause clots. It's such a low signal, you can't find it in the data. But when you talk to a neurosurgeon who says, I've done 40,000 operations for the past you know, 35 years, and uh, maybe I increased that number. I don't know what he said. It was in the thousands, <laughs> tens of thousands. Uh, anyway, I've never seen a clot form until COVID. I was re re removing one, and I was watching two form. I, I can't remember the guy's name. I saw it. I believe him. Oh, it's anecdotal. You're darn right it is, because anecdotal evidence, which used to be called evidence. <laughs> It's much better than statistical methods and papers. Yes. Yeah, John, I'd like to back you up on that as far as being created. Um, there are certain glycoproteins on the uh, coronavirus. Most notably, um, some of the uh, glycoproteins are very similar to the ones you find on AIDS, on the um, HIV virus. Most notably, like GP120, right? Never there before. There's no way that it could trans transition over accidentally. It has to be put there. Yeah. And the... And the I, I don't get into the technical. Well, stuff. I'm just saying that no, you're don't. right. You're right. I mean, yeah. if you look at the evidence, talk about evidence base. If you go to a lot of the NIH research papers, and you look at how they do the lineage and they do the actual molecular part of, of that virus, there's no way that that happened back by accident. Yeah. No way. Why they choose the spike? Why why they choose the spike protein? It's not even the same spike protein. It's similar. What what is the spike protein? Talk about a glycoprotein. Right. And you got the guys, uh, I don't want to say his name. Snake, snake, it's snake venom, it's snake venom. I wonder, like, do, do you realize what you're doing? You're making us look bad by saying it's snake, pro, snake venom. But the venom in snake, uh, or the proteins in snake venom, do resemble the spike protein. Also, the Staphylococcus enterotoxin B resembles it. Also, hymenopter, bees, ants, uh, fire ants, wasps, hornets, fox jellyfish, Portuguese man of war, scorpions. Yes, it's a, it's a protein that's a venom. Venom is a bunch of proteins. That's what causes you to react. And it could be cytotoxic, neurotoxic, cardiotoxic. Um, is, that, is that an okay to, uh, extrapolation? Yeah, I mean, look at the coronavirus. If you, if you go to some of the Sentinel um, journals, like POS, uh, uh, virology, you look at and read those, uh, um, those, those journals and everything. The coronavirus itself is well over a billion years old. When they first started talking about it, they said, well, maybe it's 70 million. They said they now know 
that it's the largest RNA infectious agent in existence, and that it is indeed um, has a very long lineage. How, how did it take a billion years all of a sudden get you know all these little lipoproteins that, that were never there? Yeah. Nature never put it there. You heard of Jason McClellan? Heard the name, but I'm not familiar. Look, look at for, for Dietrich. But I, let, let's get back to this. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to go off on conspiracy theories. Well, I think that uh, Xi Jen Li um, was the radiologist uh, out of Wuhan that uh, fabricated the. Uh, I mean, she she was she was the architect. Yeah, I. I heard different uh, military intelligence, but we let me just go on. We can talk about that later. All right, cardiac arrhythmia, you see the same pattern. These are a lot of young people. Um, I, did, I did something for somebody, 18 to 22-year-olds, college age. And in Massachusetts, I was like, so many cardiac arrhythmia that you just have questions about. And I looked up their obituaries. Um, you know, some of them, there are some drug addicts that die of cardiac arrhythmia. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. But the ones that are in college, everything's cool. That all of a sudden, in certain times of year, like before they go to school, when they have to get their shots, right? They get cardiac arrhythmia in the dorm uh, in the first or second week of school, or they get their second round, and uh, that first round was like August. They get their second round maybe October, so they can keep going to school. It, it's sad, you know, when you look through them, and the parents are told, oh, it's just a fluke thing, you know, it happens to some kids sometimes. <laughs> All right, the brain was really tough to find um, anomalies. But I found them because uh, I went through every, every code, every individual code. This is the only one that's an I code. The I codes are circulatory system. Um, you can see 2022, w which one does not look like the other, right? So then you have the G codes. And these are low numbers. So like, how do you find a signal in low numbers? Well, look at it. That's a signal. Eden was 17 from Essex. She got her shot, had a headache, went to the doctor twice, said, you have a headache, uh, here's some Tylenol. Um, but it, it resolved, her headache resolved. So she got her second shot. She died of a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis hemorrhagic stroke right after her vaccination. She is in that, she's in that four. That, that red box there, that's a person. It's a human being. Every pixel on these graphs that I show you are human beings that died. And the excess ones, and like I say, Eden was um, June 15th, 2021. And she was the third stroke that I have documented <clears throat> in three months. Um, Diane was 62. Uh, Brianna, I'm going to tell you about, was 30. They're people. And they knew. The government knew. They knew so much that doctors wrote a, uh, a paper about it. I'm going to look at my phone here because I can't see that clock. 307. Okay. <clears throat> Dysautonomia um, can cause a lot of things. You know, you don't have to tell your heart how much to beat. Your body will tell. You're breathing, try to hold your breath. Eventually you pass out and your body will do it. You don't have to think about these things. They're autonomic. Right? There are a lot of things like tachycardia that are occurring. Um, they go under the dysautonomia category. And you see that once adjusted for percent of all cause deaths, um, 2020 disappears, fades into normal, and it's only 21 and 22. And this is 15 extra deaths. What was the other one? Um, oh, I didn't put it in here. Oh, the, the graph, by the way, this one, it, these are fiscal years starting July 1st. For some reason, I, I, put, I grabbed the wrong file and put it in here. Uh, it looks the same if it's, an, if, if it's a calendar year. This autonomia we did other so then medical examiners and uh, ten, doctors attending at time of death fill out death certificates they write english words the english words are then the, the death, death records are then sent to the cdc from all the states the cdc runs it through a software called transax and another one called acme codes are then applied <clears throat> i'm looking at the codes so the words that they write to be turned into codes those words it depends on what they write. Now, a lot of stuff that they write is generic, like, you know, I don't know, neurological problem. And it, it gets coded as other disorders of central nervous system. She just thrown in this bin, right? And from that bin, catrus paribus, all other things being equal, you see that 20 is more than double 
what would be considered normal. It's a signal. And when you add up all these G codes, they were so hard to find individually, but when you find them, you add them all up, you got a significant problem. Um, encephalopathy. It's kind of it's another generic thing about the brain. And you see that uh, when you adjust for all cause, you see a separation between 20 and 21. You see where 21 and 22 are much higher. And then cancers. Um, even the cancers are all about the blood. Lymph node cancer in Massachusetts is 400% of normal in 2023. 258% of normal in 22. <clears throat> even down to the 15 to 44 age group on the far right, it's, um, it, it's more than obvious. And, and the numbers say, well, it's only 122 people. Well, it was 37, 36, 30, 40, and 49. Now it's 122. That's huge. You know, it's an extra 70 people that year and an extra 30 people the year before, so there's an extra 100 people. And they're young, too, from, from 15 all the way up. Bone and bone marrow cancer. So lymph nodes make white cells, so you know, make blood components. Uh, bone and bone marrow make uh, reds, whites, and platelets, erythrocytes, thromocytes, and all your lymphocytes, leukocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and all those crazy T cells, B cells, and everything you've heard on the news for the last few years. <clears throat> Again, you see the star, you see where 2020 drops off. A B cell lymphocytic leukemia. A 20, this is a, oh, this is another uh, fiscal year starting July 1st of um, 2021, going through June 30th of 22. You see that big number. Acute renal failure, I showed you before, but this is Minnesota. So when I said, I say more than 100,000, it's really 150,000 excess deaths in the United States. Because I don't, now, now I can include 23. Because it's still going up. What is going on? I, I do think it's the vax. I think it's remdesivir. I think it's vancomycin. I think it's a combination of all those. But it's not natural. <coughs> so 1,600 excess deaths in Minnesota in 21 22. Add another 800, so 2,400 in 23, probably. And when you extrapolate those two states with the exact same curves, which is totally unnatural, you can see where I get the 150K. And I'm being reasonable. I'm being conservative. And now in the age groups of Minnesota, just to be sure, we're not talking over 80s. Yes, it happened to them, but it also happened to these guys too. 55 to 64, it's double. And that's a lot of people. That's 100 120, 130 per year. Uh, actually, it says right here, 200, 269 extra in 21 and 22. I'm looking at the 25 to 44 in Minnesota, 63 excess. I mean, in 25 to 44, you have young parents and you have kids of people who are 50 to 70. And it sucks when you lose somebody. That's a lot of, a lot of extra people. Now, there's one that um, I, I didn't look up for a long time. I kind of found it. And um, I found it because a relative of my mine died with uh, open wounds. And then they healed, but it took a really long time. It took a specialist with special medication. It's not normal to have an open wound stay like that for months and months and months and months. Well, he did. And then so it caused me to look at skin. Massachusetts on the left, Minnesota on the right. 1,300 miles apart, completely different cultures within the medical examiner's offices. How does that happen? Didn't happen during COVID, 2020, 2021, nope. All of a sudden, 22, you, your immune system is messed up. If the vax, there's a chance, I should say. You know, if you don't have any problem and you've been vaxxed, don't worry about it. Live life. Don't, don't spend life worrying about what happened. Um, if you have something, go to the doctor and say, I think it's a vaccine. But, but don't worry. We're all going to die some, right? <laughs> Enjoy life. I, I don't want it to be negative, although uh, I say that as I go into the skull and bones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That was good timing, wasn't it? <laughs> so what is this? Why, why do they put this here? Um, I, I've been on calls with so many people. There's hundreds and hundreds of people who have lost their spouses. Um, <clears throat> they go on calls every Monday night, and, and, uh, and they trying to think of the different groups. <clears throat> There's one, uh, COVID Humanity Betrayal Memory Project, where they document all these. Six of them gave me the, the files. I, from the files in the CDC memorandum, my other publication, the original one with real names was served to the CDC director, FDH, FDA director, and NIH director, and um, 14 of their subordinates. No, 13 of their subordinates. So I went to 16 people about three days ago. And it's a notice of criminal liability. Once they know, they have a legal duty to investigate. And if they don't investigate and somebody subsequently dies, then it's murder, right? They, they took the job as the crossing guard. Not only are they telling Johnny, hey, Johnny, you know, not only are they telling him, look at me, I'll tell you when to go. They're waiting for the truck to come at 80 miles an hour. And they're saying, okay, now, go, Johnny. Now, not only do they have a legal duty, and if they don't do their duty, it's murder. They're killing people. And they're not investigating on purpose. Because you go in the hospital, a uh, 28 year old woman, right? Uh, learning disabled. Mom's worried because the, the neighbor's little O2 sensor was at um, 87%. So she brings her in. <clears throat> when she gets to the hospital, they got her at 95% oxygen. But she tests positive for COVID, so they hit her with remdesivir immediately, which means you got to stay there for five days. It's a five course treatment 200 milligrams and then 100, 100, 100, 100. <laughs> And then they start prepping her for ventilation. And I have her hourly records, hourly, blood pressure, oxygen, um, heartbeat, uh, breathing rate. I've got, I looked through every one. And when I got to the point at which they ventilated her, she was 95%. No reason to put her on a ventilator. But leading up to that, you see the lorazepam, adazolam, fentanyl, uh, it's not on here, dexmedetomidine. Um, and they, they crashed her breathing, put her on a ventilator. Even though her breathing was still fine, they put her on a ventilator anyway. Probably caused a little nick or something. She ended up with uh, bacterial pneumonia that went septic. How does it get in the body past the lungs? Because they, they did something, right? So now it's in her body. She's septic. They got to hit her with vancomycin. Then her kidneys failed, and then she died. Over and over and over, I read the same thing. You listen to people's stories. And they're told COVID killed them, COVID killed them, COVID killed them. They wouldn't have died if they didn't go to the hospital. Yeah. They murdered these people. Mm -hmm. And now the individuals maybe didn't murder because they have the defense of ignorance of fact. They're doing the protocols. But once they know, and the government knows what they do, and now I've sent them the notice, and they have to investigate if they don't, subsequent deaths will be murdered. Did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. You can pull it for all. Protocols, is that based on the EBM? Evidence based medicine? Or was um, it separate? I mean, you could see, in a way, you could say that they, they used, they knew the behavior that would flow from a centralized protocol that they pushed out of NIH, National Institutes of Health, their NIAID, Fauci's, it's a singular National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is under the National Institutes of Health. Um, I say CDC a lot, which is wrong, but I just, just in a habit of saying it. it's really NIH. But yeah, they, they knew that evidence-based, this couldn't have, I'll tell you, this could not have been done 10 years ago. 10 years before COVID, the older guys had not aged out and retired, and they never would have gone for this. There were enough old guys that would have fought this, it would not have happened. When those guys retired, you get in hospitals, it's tough for an old guy to do an emergency room, right? It's, it's a grind. So you get more younger and middle-aged doctors who are doing uh, emergency rooms and, and hospital care. And so they've all done the EBM. And they're all like, we'll do what we're told. Program. Yeah, the program. That's what happened. Uh, it, it, I get into the reasons why, and that's really important, because when you talk to somebody who's not here, if anybody here maybe wasn't on board with, uh, I'm just telling the truth. These are just facts. But if somebody's still with the narrative that doctors are good, hospitals are good, remdesivir saved me, you know, if you know, the vaccine's great, booster, 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 
to talk to somebody like that is really difficult because they're like, well, all these people can't be in on it. Like, no, they're not in on it. It's just if you, if you, whenever you centralize, you lose people at the margins, like I explained earlier. It's all um, the systems analysis and understanding economic systems, Pareto efficient outcomes, what happens over time, and how people behave. And the rationality, rational choice theory or the rationality principle of economics, the base economic principle, is that everybody acts in their own self-interest. It's very cynical, actually, right? Everybody acts in their own self-interest. But it's also very, you know, self-preservation, uh, you know, um, it's, it's innate. It's an innate characteristic to want to save yourself. Where we differ as human beings when you get into, say, Christian, uh, neighborhoods and organizations, they don't always act in their own self-interest. They do what Jesus wants them to do. They feel that way. So there, there is a difference. <clears throat> I don't like the cynical approach of everybody acts in their own self-interest, but that is a, a, a basis of all the economic theory. If you want to get into behavioral economics, we can talk some other time. I'm a big fan of behavioral economics. All right. I'm going to have to go fast. Issues. Um, hundreds of accidental deaths labeled COVID deaths. But this is what I found, right? Acute fentanyl intoxication in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 positivity. They tested a dead body for COVID. It's a COVID death. That, that's actually a federal felony. Uh, 18 U.S.C. 1035, 1040, 1343, and so on. Blunt force trauma to the head, COVID positive test. Those are in quotes. Those are the actual words on death certificates. <clears throat> so hundreds of accidental deaths, they're so bold and brazen as to do that. What do you think they did for every 80 and 90-year-old who died of a heart attack? COVID, COVID, COVID. I can't say it's all fraud. It's about probably 80 to 90% fraud. We'll never know a number, right? You can't undo all the stuff they did, but they committed fraud. I, I showed you the graphs at the beginning where it's, it's um, you know, that, that 8,800 people who died in nine weeks, a lot of it was just neglect of old people. What did I do? All right, so... I don't, I don't want to do the personal ones too much, but um, a family member had said Ian got the booster, and then uh, that was late November. He died on December 3rd when they took his heart out. It was full of clots. Um, Amaya was 12 years old. She was injected on August 3rd, 2022. She died officially on August 29th, but she did the headache, and then the headache led to hospitalization. And she died of um, cerebellar tonsillar and bilateral uncle herniation. And I can say that um, confidently because the VAERS report has the phrase cerebellar tonsillar bilateral herniation and the right time of death and the injection date. And the death certificate has the exact same words. Interestingly, the VAERS report came out six months after um, Amaya died. It takes about six months in Massachusetts for a, an autopsy like this. Mm -hmm. Somebody got the autopsy report and put it in VAERS. They used the same, they, they wrote it from, it had to be. This, uh, Cassidy was seven. Uh, it's the first chapter in my book is Cassidy. I believe it's the same person as the death certificate. I've asked the courts to tell, tell the public. You told, the medical examiner told the public, complications of coronavirus 19 viral infection. That's the only thing in part one. The medical examiner, Michelle Matthews, a defendant in my lawsuit against the state, which was dismissed and is now on appeal at the First Circuit. <clears throat> she wrote that on like 20-something death certificates with no other causes, nothing. Complications of what? Why even write complications of coronavirus 19 viral infection if you're not going to write the complications? Was it pneumonia? What was it? So um, Cassidy died on the 18th, but there's a bear's record of a seven-year-old female. There were four seven-year-old females. I go through all four in my book. And I explained three just don't fit. They died months later, or their symptoms started months before. This was first vaccine caused severe nausea and vomiting, five minutes post-injection and for the next eight to 10 hours. And then this record is about spiked a 103 degree fever, severe stomach ache, has not had a bowel movement since the day before vaccination, which makes three days without one. And then two days later, Cassidy Baraka died on the 18th. Um, the record stops at the 15th because it was entered on the 15th. And the way they did VAERS, VAERS does not let you update a record. 
So whoever inputs anything to bears, um, they're done. You, somebody dies, and on Eden's one, I told you Eden was from Sussex, uh, Essex, 17-year-old. Uh, it said, not expected to survive. And the record was put in on the 10th, and she died on the 11th or the 15th. I think the 11th. So the day before she died, the bear's record was entered, and it can't be updated to say that she died. Brianna was 30. I'm almost done. Um, yeah, this, this, this one's tough uh, because uh, it's just a nice family up uh, where all my cousins are from, where my parents are from. Um, I have about 500 relatives in Haverhill. She grew up in Methuen. She was a teacher at Methuen High School. I'll just read it, make it easier on myself. So she was injected on the 30th of March, 2021. That's only three months into the vaccination. <clears throat> the bear's record, massive stroke seizures recovered easily from COVID-19 back in November, 2020. Headache, nausea, vomiting within hours of Moderna dose, two trips to emergency department, third trip, dangerously high intracranial pressure, paralysis, seizure, Multiple brain lesions on MRI image, brain dead, life support ended April 15, 2021. And they say, well, that's two and a half weeks after she was injected. You, you know, causal correlation isn't causation. She only, they don't say she reacted in hours. She went to the ER twice. So part one said of her death certificate, non-traumatic cerebral herniation ischemic stroke. So it wasn't a hemorrhagic stroke. It was a stroke nonetheless. She had clots all through her brain. And the last thing it says, the last thing on a death certificate in part one is the root cause of death, that which began the causal chain of events that caused death. They said it was COVID. She reacted in hours to the vaccine. She had COVID three and a half, four, it's really four to four and a half months earlier. That's Massachusetts. They know what killed her. They're telling you COVID killed her, like the seven-year-old and, and so on. But in this one, <clears throat> um, six doctors from Harvard Medical College and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center wrote a report about this, and they published it in the Neurohospitalist Journal. The title is Fatal Post-COVID mRNA Vaccine-Associated Cerebral Ischemia, meaning the vaccine killed her by stroke. That's the title. Uh, Nadia McMillan was the lead author. I'm just going to read some things from the article. Venous thromboses have been linked to several COVID-19 vaccines. 24 hours after receiving her first dose, 30-year-old female, severe headache, prior asymptomatic COVID-19 infection three months early. It's really four and a half, but that's fine with three. A number of case reports demonstrated systemic thromboses post-COVID-19 vaccination. They're telling you that COVID vaccines cause strokes. They cause clots. They're telling you in every paragraph. While this patient did not have a CVSD, CVSD has been previously associated with COVID-19 vaccination, where thrombocytopenia is frequent, termed vaccine-induced prothrombotic immune thrombocytopenia, or another one's VITT, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. That's important because <laughs> Two weeks before Brianna was injected, Diane Dubois, 62 years old in Massachusetts, died from an acute intracranial hemorrhage in the setting of from cytopenia. You know, the thing that's, that's frequent from these vaccines. And five weeks later, I told you about Eden McDonald, 17 years old, died from a CVSD, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. While this patient did not have a CVSD, CVSD has been previously associated with COVID-19 vaccination. They know. They know more than just this case because they're telling you about everything. You know what? I don't, like, I don't have it here. They, they go on to further say how important it is to monitor VAERS and that this is extremely rare because they couldn't find anything in VAERS. They didn't report this to VAERS. So why would they find it? It's important to go read the thing that we're not going to put it into. Yeah. Right? A family member who's a nurse put this in bears six, six weeks after she died because she was so disgusted with the doctors for not doing it. This is at the very beginning of the vaccine, 2021. The very beginning. Diane 
Brianna and Eve. Three women in three months, chapter two of the book. You'll see all the names, the numbers. It's all official records. They can't get away from it. Oh, I did put these in here. Okay. Um, so I, they said she died of a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, uh, Eden. And then there's Diane. Um, I know this all, all this stuff by heart. Acute intracranial hemorrhage and setting a thrombocytopenia in a person treated with COVID-19 vaccination 11 days prior to presentation. So Cassidy was seven. If you, let's start with the bot. If they had investigated Diane's death, then Charles might be alive today. <clears throat> and Holly, and then Brianna, Abby, Aiden, Amaya, Ian, seven-year-old Cassidy, 11-year-old Ian, 12-year-old Maya. <clears throat> All they had to do was investigate them. Not only are they not investigating them, they're <clears throat> lying and telling the public that they died from COVID when they really died from the vaccine, or they're just shoving it aside. The CDC is also complicit. That's in the CDC memorandum. Too complicated to explain now, but an article was written. CDC was asked for a response. In the response, they said, well, we didn't code it with a Y5.9.0 viral vaccines because the death certificate says vaccination and a vaccination is not a vaccine or cause of death. Make sense? No, no. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And it's, it's a long story. It's in, the, it's in the CDC memorandum. Now to lighten it up a little bit, uh, Gunsmoke season one, episode 24, 1956, the pest hole, typhoid fever hits Dodge. Right, Rawhide, Season 1, Episode 9, Incident of the Town of Terror. Cattle and a cowboy come down with a disease that seems like anthrax. The townspeople threaten to kill all the cowboys and cattle if they come near the town. The Rifleman, Season 2, Episode 7. I watched all these. They're pretty cool. I suggest you watch them. Panic. A couple moves in... Oh, a couple moves in just outside of town, falls sick with yellow fever. One guy spreads fear and panic until many in the town try to run them out of town. <clears throat> Gunsmoke, season 13, episode 12, November 1967, death train, symptoms of plague on a train car. Doc Adams quarantines the train car, town panics and fears the train car. Um, then, you know, from 1964, I have all these shows, like, uh, all, all the way to 2023. 2023, there's a show called The Last of Us. The show is called Virus, Infection, Bird Box, Carriers, Quarantine, Epidemic, Mask of the Red Death. Um, there's one that's 28 days later was 2003. And then in 2007, four years later, they did it 20, 28 weeks later. 28 days later, 28 weeks later. I told you, diseases change and when they kill you. I am legend. Okay. On the bottom right, you see, watch YouTube Rawhide Season 2, Episode 14. If you go to YouTube in the search bar and type Rawhide, Season 2, episode 14. Watch it. You, you'll laugh, but you'll see what we just kind of went through, sort of. Vaccination? It's a fraud, I tell you, a fraud. It's an exact <laughs> quote. And then, well, I think his vaccine wore off. You know, it's seven years. Sometimes they wear off. Seven years, seven weeks, seven days. How do you know when to take it? You just have to keep taking them. <laughs> Watch the episode. It's hilarious. Of course, in the end, they talk about how great vaccines are. All right, uh, TV shows. Wait a minute. These were, oh, those were a few TV shows. Here's some more TV shows. I'm not going to go through them all. Or these movies. The Walking Dead Containment, The Last. Oh, these are TV shows. Um, where are the movies? I have movies in here. Oh, those are the movies under there. Okay. These are the TV shows. You see how many there are. We've been programmed to fear pandemics for the last 70 years through media and, and even before that and they there has not been a real pandemic since antibiotics the spanish flu was before antibiotics most people died from secondary bacterial infections yeah you know, to speak to this um you know as far as uh, scaring people the 1918 epidemic now, people really need to think about that. We had no testing. We didn't have any way, you know, you know, we didn't have any HPLC. We didn't have any other way to test to see if that indeed was a virus. How it came about, there was a research team headed by a gentleman named Stanley Hoopland in the 1970s that took a research team up to Alaska 
and he exhumed uh, some Inuit graves up there. And he did this over the next 20 years along with his teens because they didn't know that, that it was a virus. They didn't know that it was a flu. So it's a misnomer to call it a flu in 2018. They, the honest answer is that they, that they didn't know. It was officially de declared by the government in 2005 that it was a flu epidemic. And you know how they did that? When they took that little bit of DNA that they took out of the grave from the Inuit villages, 2002, they went to a level three lab. You ever see the movie um, Jurassic Park? And they take a frog and they build dinosaurs. They did the same thing. They took barely 10% of this viral material. They build a virus and they said, oh, look, it's, 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 it's a flu virus that killed everybody. <clears throat> Instead of saying the honest answer, we don't know. Yeah, they, they don't they know. They scared why. everybody. They yeah. said it was a, a flu pandemic when, in fact, you had hundreds of thousands of soldiers coming back from World War II that lived in squalor, oh. infected. Oh. I mean, they, they brought all this disease back with them. It, it was not just the flu, but other things. And they call it the flu. So they scare everybody and say, oh, we don't want that situation yeah. again. They, they also, lied about that. They wore masks, too. Yeah. Don't forget they were mad. But I, I'm uh, I'm done. Sorry, it was so long.